right, so uh, we're gonna start with the first question and it has to do with uh, enrichment activities for um, young children. Uh, first of all, in the school-wide enrichment model, we recommend general enrichment for all children. Our enrichment is divided into three categories, type one, exposing children to issues, ideas, topics that they might become interested in, type two, which relates to a series of thinking skills, creativity, think, uh, uh, analysis, synthesis, the kinds of skills that we want uh, all children to have, not just identified gifted children. And the third type of enrichment, type three, is individual and small group projects where children investigate in activity that is of interest to them. So let's say we have some primary children and you have a person come in and talk about his or her poetry. And um, they might read some poems, they might uh, show some poems on screen or in person. And then we always have a debriefing at the end of the type one. Who is interested in this? Who would like to do some follow-up? And so we might get some primary age children who are very interested in poetry and they might want to try their own poetry. So that's going from a type one to a type three. And uh, the focus of our work and probably the most important thing I would like you to remember is that the ultimate manifestation of what I call gifted behaviors. I always use the word as an adjective, not a noun. The ultimate use of it is uh, some kind of creative, productive application of our knowledge, our interests, our creativity, and our thinking skills. So it's no use learning things like advanced knowledge or advanced thinking skills unless at some time we're gonna apply them. So the focus of my work really has been on what I call uh, creative productiveness, create creative productive giftedness, as opposed to just lesson learning giftedness. So their uh, young children especially are highly creative and imaginative. And I believe we should be doing uh, some type one and type two training with them at a very early age and giving them some opportunities when they show an interest in uh, whatever the type one activity uh, might be. So um, we do this with uh, all, all ages of children. I do it with my little granddaughter who is two years old. She's very interested in music. So we play music for her and then we sing songs to her and then we ask her if she will sing some rhyming songs. So uh, we can do that with all age children. Yes, they do, but part of that is simply the pressure that's put upon them to, to score high grades. And I think that uh, the, I always distinguish between what I call lesson learning giftedness, and as I mentioned a moment ago, creative productive giftedness. So we try to give young people an opportunity to work on something in which they have an interest and they have selected the topic and even the other young people that they might like to work with say on a group project and so this is very different the goals of our type three i'm sorry the goals of our school-wide enrichment are threefold enjoyment anything that a young person enjoys or an adult for that matter they work harder at and they do better Enjoyment leads to engagement. You really get involved in it. You get excited about it. You want to do your best in it. And the third thing is enthusiasm for learning. And so, yes, there is a lot of pressure on bright young people, but it's always to get the scores on their tests up higher and higher and higher. And that's why our model places a premium on investigative inquiry, creative, productive giftedness rather than just acceleration, learning more material faster. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have some value, but we don't have enough balance in many gifted programs. It's what my daughter called high speed test preparation, test preparation on steroids. Okay, so. Uh, 
I think that one of the things that uh, we have built into, we have an online program, which by the way is translated into Turkish, where we produce an individual strength-based profile for each child. And then a search engine finds high engagement resources based on that individual child's profile. Now, in that program, we also have developed a, 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 a thing called the personal success plan. And what we do is ask children, again, based on their profile and their interests, what are some of the kinds of things that they would like to consider, for example, studying when they go to college or if they have elective courses in their school, what courses they would like to like to uh, take. And so I think that um, th this question really is something that when children get to be about uh, 12 or 13 years of age, their interests start to take shape. If you have, ask a six-year-old what he or she wants to be when they grow up, they'll say a movie actress or an astronaut or a fireman or one, some, some exotic profession. As they get around 12 or 13, there is more of a realistic uh, view of what their future might be all about. And this is why we start to see some kids that are much more oriented towards science or, or technology, other kids more uh, oriented toward uh, the humanities or the social sciences, other kids more oriented toward arts or uh, a athletic uh, uh, things for their future. So I, I think that um, we, the personal success plan tries to get young people to start to document some things in their portfolio so that there's always, they're always taking a look at their future. I recommend this, by the way, for my, my college and university students and my graduate students. So um, it, it does involve some planning. Um, very specific answer to this question. There are two kinds of assessment in this world, and one of them is assessment of learning, typically what school psych psychologists look at, children's IQ, their achievement test scores, and 99% of the kind of assessment that's done with all children is what they have already learned. I've developed a series of instruments that are called assessment for learning. And these are completed by the students. Teachers can complete some of them as well. But basically, we ask young people about their interest areas. To me, interest is the key to all successful work. We ask them about their learning styles or what, prefer, what modes of instruction they prefer. Do they like lecture? Do they like hands-on? Do they like, they like simulation? Do they like learning by playing games? Do they like a computer program type learning where it gives you the answer and the computer goes, da 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 da, that's right. Or, and they ask you the next question. The third thing we look at is, and this is a very important one to me, and that is preferred modes of expression. In the adult world, people that we know that are famous because they're quote unquote gifted or a genius, they always express themselves in one way or another. Authors do not express themselves in algebraic formulas. So um, we use this information, again, to make some decisions about the kinds of resources. And I believe that a good school psychologist should be as adept at knowing what some of the assessments for learning are as well as the assessments of learning. Some new instruments that we are developing in that genre, and these are all built into the profiler in Renzulli Learning. Just go to www.renzullilearning.com. These are all built into that. We're now building in one on uh, engagement. We're building one on executive function skills, and we're even building one on school happiness. One of the things we found is that children that are happier in school 
actually do better work in school. And so um, I would recommend that the school psychologist take a look at that and uh, especially the three instruments that are already now uh, built into the profiler. I can get more out of any child if I know their interests, their preferred modes of instruction, and the way they like to express themselves. Um, so, we, so the key word for the learning is interest, detecting from their interest. And after that, finding the true uh, learning method for the children is important, right? To, uh, to increase their engagement with their uh, learning ways. And how they like to express themselves as well. I think that uh, many people have had a fair amount of success with online learning. Are you doing a lot of online learning in Turkey? Yes, nowadays, no. yes. Uh, now, here's one of the problems that we have found uh, in the U.S. I'm sure you're finding a lot of it uh, in Turkey. And that is that um, teachers are sending out a great deal of worksheets. Uh, it's the easiest thing for, for them to do, to send out another worksheet and have the children complete that worksheet. And I think that we need to make it more interactive. One of the things that we did uh, when the virus hit was um, we allowed a free or very limited cost access to Renzulli Learning. Again, you can find out about that by going onto the website. and. Um, we now have over 2 million young people, or I'm sorry, 2 million schools around the world that are using that to send information out to children. And one of the things in Renzulli Learning that we do is we only select activities that have some engagement built into them. So if students are studying ancient Egypt, let's say, there's an activity where kids can uh, use uh, a program to build their own pyramid or dissect and preserve their own mummy. And so uh, the enjoyment factor is very high in, and also, again, leads to high engagement. But uh, I do think that, um, that we're finding more people that are interested in this because there's been too much emphasis on just sending out worksheets. Um, question number seven. Professor, sorry, so do you think that distant learning is um, effective as the uh, normal teaching methods? For example, do you think that the uh, distant learning uh, take a place of the uh, normal uh, learning? Do, do you think yes. so after I, this period? Yeah, I, I think it's a more hands-on approach to distance learning, trying to get children to be more active in what they're learning just rather than receiving and storing information, the usual test preparation kind of learning that uh, teachers have been sending out with an endless amount of, of worksheets. So for the gifted children, this distance learning would be an advantage or disadvantage because uh, for example, you just told about Renzulli methods has uh, multi-dimensional -di method, teaching method, has teaching methods. So that in this uh, scenario, what it would be, is it kind of an advantage or disadvantage for I think, it's an, I think it's an advantage and I think that even after this pandemic passes, we're going to see more distance learning going on and I think that, um, that the uh, concept is a great concept because distance learning, you can have children in Turkey taking a course from a highly accomplished artist or scientist or musician. And so a lot of those things are out there. Many of them have no cost associated with them. And so I think that the, if the internet has done anything, it's been able to bring wonderful resources to the farthest corners of the world, a school that may be way out in the mountains of Eastern Turkey, and it takes three days to get there from Istanbul. But nevertheless, 
the internet has allowed those young people to enter into the world of higher knowledge and, and, uh, and higher access to resources. Um, I think that there are a couple of them that uh, I have been very fond of. Uh, one of them is very well known, John Dewey, uh, and his uh, whole uh, focus on more hands-on kind of learning. Uh, the other one is a man that may or may not be as well known, but uh, he's really influenced me greatly. His name is uh, F. Period Paul Brandwine. And he wrote a book called The Gifted Student as Future Scientist. And his whole approach to developing future scientists was to give kids, again, more investigative research type projects of their own. He, his, his students won more. There was a famous competition in America. The names changed, but it used to be called the Westinghouse Talent Search Concept uh, Program. He had more winners of the Westinghouse talent search than most of the other teachers in the country combined. Um, others that have influ influenced my work are uh, Dr. Paul Torrance, who is the founder of the Torrance Tests of Creative Thinking. And uh, by the way, we have the first world scorable creativity test developed by a young man from Turkey uh, named Sabisi. We have the first machine scorable creativity test built into that program. And one of the big problems with the testing for creativity is they had to be hand scored by humans, which was very time consuming and expensive. So uh, that's a great advancement. But those are, those are some of the people that uh, were major influences on my work. Um, very interesting question. It proceeded from experience. When I was a teacher, um, I was asked to develop a program for our most able students in science. And there was no canned off the shelf curriculum for that. So I had to, in a, I was free from anything that was prescribed. And that's where, again, I read the work of someone like Paul Brandwine and a few others and decided that I was not going to teach in that class the same way I taught in my regular science class, which was basically information giving to get kids to understand so they could pass the test. Here's something also very interesting that happened. Uh, although this program was developed, I was asked to develop it for gifted students. And at that time, that meant you had to have an IQ of 130 or above. I knew that I had science students in my class that didn't have an IQ of 130, but were very, very interested in science, uh, were, were very creative and inventive in some of the kinds of things that they came up with. So I snuck them into the program, even though they didn't have the 130, and they did as well or better because of high creativity, high motivation, high interest in science. And so that's one of the reasons that even today, my theory says general enrichment for all students and opportunities, resources, and encouragement to follow up when a young person turns on to a particular topic. Um, question number nine. Oh, and by the way, I still go to schools and see things happening in classrooms, and they're really good. And I tell the teacher, write an article on that, and I blend some of it into our model. So my information that goes into our model really starts with the classroom, not with any theoretical approaches. The theory always comes last to me. It's practical experiences. And guess who knows what will work best in classrooms, professors or teachers? Teachers, of course. Teacher, teachers, of course. Probably uh, cooking. Really? Uh, 
Yep. Cooking is really chemistry applied. Uh, I love cooking. And uh, I always start with the recipe just as it's given. But then I start to change a little bit. Oh, I'm going to throw in a little bit more oregano or a little bit more of this. Or uh, uh, when I'm baking my bread, uh, it says set the oven to 350, but I want to try it at 400 with the lid off so the top gets nice and brown. So I like cooking because it really gives me a chance to be uh, very experimental, uh, try different things out. I must tell you also that some things have not worked out very well. <laughs> uh, it, it nevertheless uh, is, is uh, if I were uh, a young person uh, looking for a career, I would probably go and try to study with one of the famous chefs of the world uh, after I went to cooking school, of course. But uh, that's what I would do. So uh, during this quarantine, have you um, improved your cooking skills? I'm sorry? So during this lockdown, I mean this pandemic, have you improved your cooking skills? I I've been doing a little bit more cooking uh, during the pandemic. And uh, again, a little bit more uh, bread baking uh, because uh, I like to try new things out and I've got more time on my hands. And so I do spend a lot of time working online, just what we're doing now. It seems like I'm online one day or another for almost everything. But um, uh, nevertheless, I have been doing uh, more experimentation uh, on my cooking. And uh, when I see a recipe, I'm on some sites where they put recipes on every day. When I see one that really pops out at me, I uh, copy it, download it, print it, and go buy the ingredients. I, I never thought when I started out uh, that uh, there would be so much acceptance of my work, although I didn't go into this for it not to be successful. Um, ever since I was young, um, I learned at a very early age that I had to be a good problem solver. And the reason was that I grew up uh, under very, very humble experiences. My father died when I was eight. Uh, my mother was raising three children, uh, cleaning floors and scrubbing people's houses. And if I wanted something, I had to figure out how to get it. If I wanted a new pair of sneakers, because the cardboard covering the holes in my sneakers wasn't keeping the water out, I had to figure out how to do it. And so I started a lot of little business, uh, cutting and, uh, and uh, collecting wildflowers and going from door to door selling them, for example. Um, collecting soda bottles at the beach. We lived, I lived near the ocean uh, because there was a two cent deposit on bottles. Now it's five cents, but I would collect, I would go to the beach after it closed in the afternoon and pick up all the soda bottles and turn them in so that uh, I could buy uh, bread for the family. And uh, it was always, um, I've always been very entrepreneurial because that was a way of problem solving for me. And uh, some other things uh, that I, when I was young, uh, my seventh grade teacher found out, I, I was not, let's call it the best student in the school. In fact, I was probably in trouble a lot. But my seventh grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Kent, uh, found out that uh, she came to me one day when I was uh, sitting on the detention bench because I had gotten in trouble for fighting on the playground. And she said, you know, I noticed that you, you really do some very nice writing for my uh, English class. And uh, what would you think about starting a school newspaper? And all of a sudden, you see the creative productivity there, product, audience, outlet. And all of a sudden, I had something that really was of high interest to me to devote my energy to. And so I started the school newspaper and wrote a number of columns and uh, got other people involved. Somebody else did the sports column and somebody did cartoons and somebody did the masthead and all of those kinds of things. And what, it, what I learned from that is that if you have something that is more productive than getting into a fight on the school ground, that you're going to put your energy into that. And it also helped me make a lot of friends, talk about social and emotional learning, 
that was a good vehicle for me uh, to develop those skills. things that I believe is that all students these days need to start to learn about learning how to learn skills in technology besides creative thinking and, and thinking skills and research skills we there are so many changes taking place there are now artificial intelligence programs in all of the learned professions there's a program in law, for example, that you can put in um, what the problem might be. Uh, I'm having an argument with my neighbor over the boundary and uh, the, there are boundary dispute cases. It will go through and analyze all of the boundary dispute cases in the, in, that, that have ever existed and there are, that are in, in the data banks on law. It will actually analyze those it will write a legal brief for you. And so all of a sudden now, law assistants are gonna be out of jobs and even lawyers are gonna be out of jobs. If you, and, it, and by the way, it's more accurate than if lawyers did it themselves with a regular without AI. Uh, there are systems now where dermatologists uh, can use a cell phone camera to study whether or not I just had some basal cells removed from my nose the other day. Uh, there are programs now where I wouldn't even have to go to the doctors to do that. I would just photograph those with my camera and they would determine whether or not I had to have a procedure done. Um, there's another program for sports writers where if I put in all of the basic facts for let's say a, uh, a football game, a soccer game, we call it soccer, you call it football, and the scores and who did outstanding plays and what the scores were at different times throughout the game, I can put that information in. It will actually write me a draft of an article for the sports page of a magazine or newspaper. So now what I'm advising young people now is what they need to, um, see if I've got a diagram somewhere on this. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, I don't know if you can get a close-up of this, but um, I'll put it like that. These are what I call core competencies. And one of the, what you see is creative thinking skills, um, technology skills, um, executive function skills, uh, higher level thinking skills, and basic investigative skills. And we teach a lot of that in gifted programs today but the one that we're not teaching enough other of is, again, the learning how to learn skills and technology. Uh, they have, believe it or not, coding programs for primary grade children, very early on programs that teach them how to do coding. You know what artificial intelligence is. It's yeah. teaching a computer to think like a human being. And so they give them little programs where they group different pieces, they get lots of different figures, and which ones go together and teaching them very basic coding skills. And I do think that uh, that's gonna be very important uh, for all young people. We often thought that AI and technology was only going to get rid of the jobs of assembly line workers and truck drivers and people who you know, did routine jobs, but not any longer, it's actually influencing the more advanced career professions that our highest ability students go into. And even some colleges and universities have expressed an interest in this new theory. I call it the catch a wave theory of adaptability. And the reason I call that is in a profession, you're riding a wave, but now with all the changes in jobs, that job may out of, go out of existence or change. The wave will crash. So you've got to learn how to catch a new wave to stay on top of your profession. And that's why in this work that I'm doing in uh, the 
I call it the catch a wave theory is we constantly have, have to be learning how to learn new skills in whatever area we're working in. Just like your people that are going to watch this, um, this program, hopefully will learn some new skills about that they might apply to their program. Um, Professor, may I ask you a question? Yes. You, you mostly talk about the art, uh, t improving our artificial skills on how to learn. So uh, I would like to say that in Turkey, exactly in the state schools, um, they don't have lots of technological devices to use this kind of artificial uh, um, teaching methods for the uh, for the class, for the year uh, students. So how these teachers can uh, improve their uh, students, uh, teach their students capacity by enlarging uh, capacity, as you said, as you mentioned before, without these technological uh, artificial sciences. Do you have any advices for these teacher without these? Yeah, and virtual reality as well. Well, teachers have to learn about some of it themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the, in, they don't have to necessarily become expert in it, but they have to learn how you would teach children, for example, to go online. Just take a simple example, like uh, Photoshop. Um, you know, just teaching some young people, here's a program that allows you to take a photograph and manipulate it and put a picture of your best friend in and make the, in one of the uh, uses of this diagram, I've made a PowerPoint where all of these wheels were learning how to turn because I made them into gears rather than wheels because they all interact with one another. Well, I wanted to get that concept across. So I went online and learned how to give motion to this. If, you, if I showed th this to you as a PowerPoint, it would begin by all the gears turning and interacting with each other. And teachers have to learn some of that themselves. Um, which really leads me to your next question. I believe that, that first of all, um, uh, enjoyment of what they're teaching. Uh, there's nothing worse than a teacher who have some, ha, is teaching something that they don't care about. You know, they're, they're gonna be less than excited, less than enthusiastic, and therefore will not highly engage students. So I think that there has to be that spark of enjoyment of being a teacher, which I think is the most important profession in the world. The teachers are creating, the, are the legislators of the world. Who you teach today will become a prime minister in Turkey and a member of the Turkey government and a doctor at a Turkish hospital. And so we create the future, but you also have to be a person that, that really enjoys what you're doing. Um, the second thing is uh, openness to new experiences. Again, the teaching profession has changed radically because of the internet. Any teacher that's not using resources that are available on the internet is behind the time. So you've got to be open to new experiences. You have to be flexible. Uh, I also think that there is something very important in teaching, which I will simply call kindness. Sometimes it's not, it's easy not to like a child who may be unusual, that may have some problems, that may ask too many questions. Uh, and I think that in many cases, they're probably the children that need a good understanding teacher the most. Um, I think that um, the, uh, it's easy to like, you know, the bright, young, smiling, uh, lovable, laughable, dateable young child that's very popular. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But sometimes it's children that may have some difficulties that might not have the kind of parenting or love or environment at home. I'll never forget a woman that I taught with a number of years ago. And um, one of the teachers made a, uh, in the teacher's room, we were all talking and they were talking about a little kid that was in trouble a lot. And one of the teachers said, yeah, 
he's wearing that same dirty t-shirt that he's worn every day this week. And Mrs. Stunt said, did you ever think that there might not be another clean t-shirt home in the drawer? And that shut that teacher's mouth up very quickly. So I think that there's a kindness factor that's very important in teaching. And that also goes again, right with the love, the love of teaching and the love of being with young people. And again, the other thing that we've already mentioned, and I will reiterate is, teachers never have, can stop learning how to learn new skills in any of the uh, five areas that I call the core competencies, and even in just the areas and the topics that they, that they are teaching. If you're a teacher and you're teaching about World War II, um, there's always a new book coming out about World War II, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and uh, there's always somebody that has documented their experiences. Uh, very few World War II veterans in America are left alive, but some of them are documenting, they been, are being interviewed about the battles they fought in and some of their experiences during the war. And so, it's not just the thinking skills and creativity and technology that they have to learn about, but get, going a little deeper into their subject. I have a teacher that sent me a thing uh, just yesterday that she found, a, uh, he found a YouTube uh, on um, TED Talks uh, related to, um, oh, the topic was uh, procrastination. And uh, he sent that to all the people in our group and said, you know, we talk about bright kids procrastinating. That was even related to one of your earlier questions. And so uh, that person uh, sent that around and I, I put that right in my file my, for classes that I'll teach. I'll be using that little 11, 12 minute uh, YouTube on procrastination. Um, okay. Um, so, Professor, can I ask you something before starting yeah. a new question? When you were a student, you, did your teachers have these qualities and how did it affect you or your classmates? Do you have a story about your school years? Well, I, I mentioned the story about Mrs. Kent uh, getting me to start the school newspaper. Uh, another experience that I have that will stick in my mind for a long time is I had an older brother who was two years ahead of me in school, uh, a very uh, uh, intelligent, uh, also very charming young man. And uh, the guidance counselor from the high school came to help us to select our high school program. And knowing, again, our family circumstances, we were very poor. They put my brother into a general track and when my turn came along, um, Mrs. Mamula, my eighth grade teacher said to me, Joe, you're a clever fellow. Don't listen to that old biddy. You take the college track and you will figure out some way to go to college. You'll figure out a way to raise the money or get a scholarship or whatever. My brother went through the general track and it took him many years. He had to go to a uh, night school, community college after high school, eventually went on to uh, a, a bachelor's degree at a very well-known university. He got a lot of scholarships. He got a master's degree. He has a PhD in history and went on to become a, a rather recognized historian in his field. The point is that he, he didn't have Mrs. Manuel's advice. She should have said to him, uh, uh, take, take the college track, but she didn't at the time. And don't ask me why, because he's much smarter than I am. And so I think that that little bit of advice from my uh, eighth grade teacher, not to listen to the high school guidance counselor who knew I was from a very poor family and wanted me to take the, the general. She even wanted me to go to trade school to learn how to be a typesetter, a person that sets type for newspapers, uh, which was crazy. Um, we'll, we're gonna move along. Um, I think 
I've really covered that. Uh, again, I've mentioned that some uh, college academic officers have already expressed an uh, interest in my catch wave theory. They're realizing that in fact, you know, it used to be you went to high school, you went to college, you got a master, a major degree, may have gone to a, onto a uh, graduate program in your career area, and then you took a job and you stayed on that job forever. I think that they are realizing that right now, a lot of very bright people are taking certificate programs and having uh, stacks of certificates to show future employers that they know how to do this or they know how to do that. And I do think that um, colleges and universities uh, are going to have to start to think about getting, we used to, in the in Industrial Revolution, we thought you needed a high school degree to go anywhere in life. And of course, people realized that that was not true. And now we think, well, you need a college education to go anywhere in life. That's no longer true. Learning how to learn skills must be a lifelong skill that all people who graduate from college and higher degrees even have. I'm still learning and I've got many, many degrees and lots of experiences. I'm learning almost every day. I get a lot of blogs where new research is coming out. So it's learning how to learn skills that are the most important kind of learning uh, that we can do with college students. And again, I was so happy when, again, some academic officers heard about the catch a wave theory and actually asked me to uh, send them material and to make a presentation uh, for them. Um, Sally Reese, who is my partner and wife, um, were to actually, we, we developed it on a lot of investment capital, about $10 million that came to the University of Connecticut. And it was our hope to be able to give it away free. But one of the things, not knowing one iota about businesses, that it takes a lot of money to run one of these things. You have to have people that are in the uh, the, the uh, customer service department, you have to have people who are in marketing and sales to get the word out. You have to have people that are constantly updating the databases and infusing new technology in, into the system, which is what we're doing now uh, with um, our, our consultant from Turkey, uh, Murad Sabisi is his name. Uh, and so, the university uh, sold it to a private company. Uh, Sally and I do not make five cents off of that program, but um, we couldn't give it away. And so one of the things is that schools have to pay a fee. I think it's worth every penny they pay. And I think they also have a, a family edition where a parent can get it just for their own child for a very small amount of money. But I think that that's one of the, the disadvantages of it. The other disadvantage, I'm sorry to say, is that if teachers don't know how to use the program effectively, it's not going to have the impact that it should. Uh, the company that owns it now developed a number of courses, uh, staff development courses for teachers. There's even, they even have a little quiz at the end of each module to make sure they got it. And I think that when teachers understand it, like anything else, then it will have greater use. Uh, there are some teachers that are very adept at technology. Guess what? Their students are using more technology. There's some teachers who still are a little scary about technology, and so they haven't adapted. So I think that that's the, the, those are the two major disadvantages. I wish it were free because I'd li like all children around the world to have it. But guess what? It wouldn't have been translated into Turkish if we didn't hire somebody with AI, artificial intelligence, that could push some buttons and all of a sudden, here the program is in Turkish, and then also teaching Turkish users how to input Turkish resources into the 14 databases that, or that the children have access to. Um, I guess that's a pr pretty much uh, about 
the, the disadvantages. Uh, one of the things I will say is that Sally and I developed Renzulli Learning. We invented it because we knew that teachers could not do the kind of teaching that I'm talking about today, more, more personalized, uh, more high engagement teaching without an easy to use technology program. And that's why we developed it. And if you were to fill out all the instruments in our program, uh, interest, learning styles, expression styles, etc., you would have a pile that high for your classroom. And that's just the beginning. You would have to go through and still analyze those to see what the major interests were. Guess what? The machine now does it all for you at the push of a button. So I think that all those things cost money and that's why uh, in a certain sense, I'm glad that a, a business that knows how to run a business uh, bought it from the University of Connecticut. One of the things is that because of the ease and electronic scoring of standardized achievement tests, that we've gone far too far in that direction. In the US, and I'm sure it's same, the same in Turkey, if you have things like that are called in the US school report cards, they evaluate schools and teachers on how high their achievement scores are. And so what does that force teachers to do? I gotta get you ready for that test. More memorization, more worksheets, more, one of my students calls it drill and kill. And, and so the, the overemphasis on that has really driven our profession into something where we can't use our imaginations. We can't make learning more engaging, more fun, and more enjoyable. And one of the things that is fortunate or unfortunate, as the case may be, is a favorite quotation of mine, that which is evaluated gets done. So, suppose that we evaluated schools on creativity, how many creative ideas kids come up with in a given period of time, in addition to reading and math scores. We say, we're gonna give your school a score. You're gonna get three scores. You're gonna get a math score, a reading language arts score, and a creativity score. Now, a little harder to evaluate than just, you know, looking at, at answer sheets, but, if that was part of what your schools were evaluating, then it would get done. So um, one of the things that um, I've been working on uh, is um, trying to get uh, a little bit more of that into the way that teachers, uh, that we look at what teachers are doing related to imagination, uh, creativity, and innovation. How much of that are they doing? And uh, can we give more emphasis to it if they're not doing enough? And this is not a way of grading teachers. It's just saying, Mr. or Ms. X, Y, or Z, take a look at, at what you're doing. Are you doing enough of that? And again, if it's a requirement in the school report card, then they're gonna start to do more of it. A basic economic principle that which is evaluated gets done. And the second one is supply creates its own demand. We've actually developed a system where teachers can look at how much emphasis they're putting on various things related to imagination, creativity, and innovation. And then we ask them to guess how, much their, how their students would rate them on this. And then we ask the students, so let's say the teacher has a very high rating. Their ideal for doing that is very high, but he or she says, well, I'm not doing great. I'm gonna give myself a four rather than a five. And then we ask the students the same questions and they give her a one. Then the teacher looks at that data and says, I'm a long way from my ideal. I've gotta do more of that. So it's, a, it's what's called formative assessment not to grade you or evaluate you, but to ask you to take a look at yourself. That's we were so honored to uh, host you today.
Well, I'm sorry that, that for the delay, but we, we got it done. And I wish yeah, you all a very okay. good day. And I hope that life in Turkey, like life in the U.S., will get back to some kind of normality very quick. By the way, we've got 40 Renzulli Academies in Turkey. They're called Bilfen, B-I-L-F-E-N, Academies. And you might want to uh, get in touch with them because I think the best way to see what we're doing is not just to hear Joe Renzulli talk about it or even to read about it, to actually go and see it. Uh, my favorite quotation, it's on the bottom of my email, example is the best school of mankind and they will learn at no other. So visit some Bilfin Academies and uh, I think you, that your teachers will start to see they're doing a really great job. They send me a lot of information every, every couple of months. I get lots of the uh, examples of the great stuff they're doing.